Hi everyone, and welcome to Grace Church Online. My name is Skyler, and I get to be the Young Adults and Intern Director here at Grace. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Right now, would you say hi in the chat and share where you're watching from? We will be here every Sunday at 9.30 or 11 for an interactive service. We're so thankful for our online community. I have a few announcements for you before we worship together. We're excited to announce that Women of the Word Spring Session starts April 13th and 15th. They will be studying stories of faithful women from the New Testament. You can sign up today online. Are you looking to pay off debt, save, or invest in the future? Then Financial Peace is for you. It is launching April 20th right here at Grace. Signups are online. Hey parents, save the date for VBS June 28th through July 2nd. And save the date for Wild West Family Camp July 23rd through the 25th. Rooted will be starting today. Rooted is our 10 week discipleship program here at Grace. It's a great way to grow closer to God and engage in a healthy community. It's not too late to sign up. And last but definitely not least, Young Adults is launching a new series on April 15th. Come join us at 7 p.m. for a great time. That's it for announcements. Church, let's pray before we worship. Join me. God, we love you so much. Thank you for all that you have store for us for this worship service. I pray you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
I want to welcome those who are tuning in. So glad that you're here. It's uh, great to have you. And if you happen to be on at 9.30 or 11 o'clock, there are some online hosts that would be happy to connect with you. Uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, we're starting a series this morning uh, on 1 John, and I'm excited to do it. Uh, I've been here 39 years. I've never gone through 1 John with the church. And so uh, I think this is going to be a great time. And, and when we think about that, I, I want us to start thinking about an invitation because God really has invited us to a relationship with him. Now, when I think uh, about being inv invited, invitations coming, you ever been uh, in a situation where you've heard about uh, some kind of an event or some big party where all the right people are there and, and you're thinking you're going to be invited, but the invitation never actually came. Or, or it's maybe you heard it was just the cool kids or the in group that got invited. Or maybe because of COVID restrictions, it was a limited amount of people. So you didn't get the invitation and, and you were disappointed. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where there was kind of an icebreaker question, that question that goes off like this? If you could uh, have dinner with any famous person who would you choose? And of course, people step back and think about that. And, and the, you do get to kind of reveal uh, your interest when you start thinking about who would you choose to have dinner with. And, and, and that's been a question I've been asked a couple times. And I really kind of struggle with that question because, frankly, uh, I'm not really drawn to famous people. Uh, in fact, the only the closest thing I ever had to have dinner with a famous person was that I actually had dinner one time with Robert Redford. And, and it happened like this. My wife and I were down in Sundance, Utah, and we went into a restaurant that he owned in the resort that he owned. And, and we sat down, we were having dinner and in walk Robert Redford. And he, he sat down with his group of people and we had dinner, they had dinner we had dinner together and that's as close as I've ever gotten to have dinner with a famous person. And, and I think about all of that and I, and I think about the fact that God really has invited us to have a relationship with him. I, I remember being a kid and there was a a group of people who came to our church. And I, I remember that there, that was a kind of a special night. This group, they sang songs and they, they, they spoke. And, and there was something that was about, uh, something about them that they were real. And there was something authentic about them. And there was something about their relationship with the Lord. And, and in that evening, I, I remember even as a little kid thinking to myself, I, I want to be 
a person like that who has a real authentic relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's not phony, not religious, that it was real. And, and, and I wanted to be a part of a group of people who knew the Lord and had an authentic faith. And, and when I think about the fact of relationships, my relationship with God, my relationships with other people, the reality is this. The most, the most important things in life uh, really aren't things at all. The most important things in life are relationships. Uh, I've had the privilege on several occasions to be with people as they were in the process of death. And I, I've never ever had anyone in that situation ever ask that they could, for somebody to bring some item or something. All people want in times like that are people, the people they love, the people they care about. Because the truth is, is that sometimes the things that we think are so important really at the end of the day are, are not important at all. And the things that we hold on to someday will be sold in some garage sale and, and our kids will be happy when they see it go down the driveway and disappear. See, the most important things in life are not things at all. They really are the relationships we have. And, and John writes these letters, 1 John, 2 and 3 John. And, and this John is the same John who writes the gospel of John. And he also writes the book of Revelation. But when we think about the gospels, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very straightforward, lots of information, tell straightforward stories. John, his gospel is a little different. Yes, the stories are factual, they're straightforward, and yet there's some other thing taking place there. John is writing his gospel for a purpose, and that is for us to believe, to really have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at this point in time, John is an old man. He's, he's watched the other disciples die in, over the years, most of which have been put to death because of the testimony of the resurrection. And, and now John is writing this letter, and he's writing this letter really as an encouragement an encouragement for people to stay in the faith, to stay focused, to not leave. Because at that point in time, people were actually leaving the faith. Here is this small church, this beginnings, I should say, of the church of Jesus. And people are starting to float away, going after other teachings, other, other, um, um, other people and other groups. I think about this last year. There really has been a sifting that has gone on. And in this sifting, people who uh, have, people have, have really gotten off focused. And there are, there are some people, I should say, some people have gotten off focused over this last year. And they've embraced political focus and they've gotten there's, there's this all it seems like this always happening a new conspiracy theory that's out there and people go after that as well as false teachings teachings about God and his nature that has been happening since the beginning even back to why John is writing because there is this false teaching going on and people are leaving the church and then you add to that people who add to the gospel, which is what, what I call religion. Things that you have to do to get God's approval. And, and John writes this letter to remind us that we are people of faith that need to remain in the faith. To stay focused, to stay focused on what Jesus has done and his invitation in uh, that he gives us, his invitation that he gives us to have a relationship with him. Now, now this letter is, is not like any other letter in the New Testament. It's not written to a, a person. It's not written to a church. It really is written to the church, all of us. And with that, 
I'd like us to start reading it. And what I'm going to do is just read the first five verses of 1 John. And then I'm going to go back and walk through those verses. So if you have your Bibles, please, please turn and let's, let's look at this. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. And John starts this way. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we, we have looked at, and our hands have actually touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. That's his phrase, his title for Jesus. The life appeared and we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and what we've heard so that you also may have fellowship, fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him. And we declare this message to you. God, God is light. And in him there is no darkness. No darkness at all. Now I want to go right back to the very beginning of 1 John. The very first verse. That which was from the beginning. I love the fact that John takes us immediately to the very character and nature of God, takes us before creation itself, takes us to a place where all that exists is God. Before all things, God who is love, God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father and the very essence of their relationships is, is the very presence of the Holy Spirit. And before John tells us about God's love, he also tells us about his nature. He tells us that God is light and that speaks of his character. And, and I want to begin by saying God is this amazing God who is better than anything we could imagine about God. Now what is so uh, interesting is, again, John makes us think about the very beginning. And I think about the, the, the book of Genesis and how Genesis begins and how the gospel of John begins. And I want you to see the connection, uh, how First John says, that which is from the beginning and Genesis, the very beginning of the scripture says, in the beginning, God, it all started with God, God who created the heavens and earth. And in 1 John, again, he goes back to the very foundation, the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, the gospel of John says this in verse 14. It says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. Again, speaking of the very character and the very nature of of God. Now I love this because what John in his gospel is saying is this, God became accessible and available to me. God became accessible to me. And I can personally experience the one who is eternal, the eternal one, God himself. I can experience this God who's become very, very accessible to me. Now going back to 1 John chapter 1, it says that which is from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at with our hands and have touched. Again, this is a very accessible God. This is a God that we've touched, we've heard, we've seen him, we've examined him. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. 
the, the life appeared and we have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Now the implications of what John is saying are absolutely absolutely enormous. The idea that this eternal God is access, accessible to us that is, is, is so amazing. In, in the most basic way, he's accessible. I, we've touched him. We've felt him. We saw him. We, we can relate to him. We know him. This eternal one has revealed himself to us. Now, now John, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, goes on and he says this, We proclaim to you that, that which we have seen and that which we have heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim what we've seen. We've proclaimed to you what we've heard. For this purpose that we can have fellowship. Fellowship is this interesting word because it's kind of, in some ways, a, a, a churchy word. It, it's, it's kind of like, well, we're going to have fellowship. Usually there's some type of potluck or food involved. You know, that's, that's what fellowship is all about. Uh, what, what John is referring to when he talks about fellowship is this really sharing in something that you have in common, a, a bond together, that you're a common bond, a common life, a, a communion, as it were, a, a living, breathing relationship with another person. That's this fellowship that we have, this connection that I have with someone because of some common thing that I am experiencing and they're experiencing. And that we can have this fellowship, not only with people, but with God. Our fellowship is with God the Father and with his son, Jesus. That God invites us into his relationship. That our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. That, that it is God who has invited us into this relationship that they have, Father and Son. Now, now the Greeks, the, the culture of that day valued fellowship. They valued this uh, deep relationships with other people. However, they never imagined uh, a, a connection or a relationship or a, a fellowship with God. The idea that you could have that kind of a relationship with God, something that would be called fellowship or a sharing or a communion or a, or a common bond, that the idea that you could have that with God is a revolutionary idea. It is something that they could never, ever imagine. The readers that would have read this book, it would have been something that would have surprised them, it, it, literally shocking to them. And, and, and frankly, even to us, it should amaze us that we can have a relationship with God. God invites us into a relationship with him. Now, now get that. It's, it's very important. He invites us into a relationship with him. It is not God tagging along with us. And, and Jesus really started this revolutionary idea when they ask him, how do we pray, Jesus? And Jesus gave us this response. He said this, when you pray, pray this way, our Father, which is in heaven. Jesus came to show us what God the Father was all about. He invites us into that kind of relationship that God is our Father. That I can have a relationship with God as Father and with Jesus Christ. Not only is Jesus my Savior, he can also be my friend. Uh, he, is my, he can be my closest relationship. And, and that God is our Father. It is the Father and the Son that lets us into their relationship. This relationship that they're sharing. This relationship of love between the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father. 
Now, when we think about this, this idea that God is our father, so often we think of our earthly fathers. And the reality is this. We've all had different experiences when it comes to our earthly fathers. From fathers who have been absent or abusive to fathers who have been really good and perfect in so many ways, yet at the same time, no earthly father is ever perfect. Everyone has some type of shortcoming and everyone carries around in them some type of father wound. And that's why Jesus came showing us what God the Father was all about because the truth is we all long, long for the Father that can only be found in God himself. And he is our Father. And he invites us into this relationship with Jesus. Now, his invitation is into their relationship, the father and the son, that I join in that love relationship that the father and the son has for each other. It's not simply adding a little bit of Jesus in my life so that I can do better in life. See, see, too often people have approached it this way. They thought in terms that they have a work life, they have a love life, they have a, a gym life, they have a home life, and oh yeah, I also have a Sunday morning go to church life. And it's just a, adding a little bit of Jesus to all kinds of areas of my life. But the truth is, is that Jesus is not interested in just being added as an additional thing to your life so that you could be better. Jesus wants to be your life. Another way to say it is this. Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, you know, the priority is God first, family second, job third. And this is this idea that God is first in my life and second, you know, I have this list. But here's the truth. God is not interested in being on a list. He's not even interested in being first on the list. He wants to be the list. The whole list. It is God in everything in my life. Everything. And that's the kind of relationship that he invites us into. That we are people that enter into that type of a relationship which is truly life. And our shared fellowship with others is because we have that kind of real relationship with God. And when I think about the church and the family of God, I almost have to laugh and smile. Where, where in the world do you get such a group of people that are so different in so many ways? So many different backgrounds and culture and economic situations and all kinds of things. Such a variety of people from different places, yet we have this one common bond together. And that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus is in our life, we have this common fellowship. And that fellowship is for a purpose. John says it, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he says, to make our joy complete. Joy. Joy, there's this sense of this abiding optimism that is based on God. Because of God. No matter what's taking place in the chaos of this world, because of God, my joy can be complete. It, which is just the opposite, by the way, of, of a happiness that is based on circumstances. That we have a joy that is based on God himself. Now I want to see, I want you to see uh, what this is all about, this relationship. And it's really described well in the Gospel of John John chapter 15, where Jesus just literally hours before he goes to the cross is with his disciples and it continues to unpack for them what's going to be taking place. And he says this, as the father has loved me. And he, he says, I have this love relationship with the father. The father loves me. So I have loved you. <laughs> You're in this relationship. 
now remain in my love. That's just such a powerful statement. God, the Father has loved me. I have loved you. Now stay connected. Stay focused. Stay in that love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. That's Jesus' desire that the joy that he has would be in each and every one of us and that your joy may be complete. Now he goes on and says this. My command is this. It's such a beautiful statement. When we think about obeying his commands, you start thinking about a list, but Jesus, again, isn't talking about a list. He's talking about this command. Love each other as I have loved you. That's the command of God, that we would love each other in the same way that he has loved us. Enter into that same relationship. And greater love has no one than this, that you lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, you are my friends. He elevates our relationship. He, he raises it. He calls us friends. And if you do what I have commanded, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his, master, his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. He calls us friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I've made known to you. The Lord has invited us into his relationship. This relationship that God the Father has with his son and the son has with the father. He has invited us to join in that relationship. Now, here's the thing. For some that are listening to this right now, that is not very appealing at all. In fact, it's very unappealing. And it's unappealing because you don't really know the nature of God. Because God's nature really has been questioned. And you think about back to Genesis, the very beginning when the serpent came, the very first thing the serpent did was question the nature and the goodness of God. And if we think that there's a dark side of God, then that invitation isn't very appealing. It's kind of like an eighth grader who has just been told that they have been invited into a relationship with the principal or vice principal. You know what that kind of relationship is all about. It's, it's about a relationship that is about you keeping the rules and somebody on top of you making sure you obey and, and that you fly right and fly straight. It, it's that kind of idea and this, this idea that, that this God is always going to be just ready to thump you and correct you because we think that there's a dark side. The, the second thing is that it's not appealing because we feel disqualified which has to do with sin. And next week we're going to look with, at that idea. But this week I want to focus on the character and nature of God. When it has to do with his character, when I really understand that God is a God who is great and he is goodness, when I understand who he truly is, the reality is this. I want to have a relationship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Such a key verse. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. And in him there is no, none, zero, no darkness at all. No darkness that, that verse is really all about the character and nature of God. What he is really all about. That, that God does not have a dark side. That, that he isn't something, someone who's ready to pounce on us when we do something wrong. See, here's the reality. Way too often, we make up God and we make him like us. We, we take our qualities 
all of our good qualities plus a little bad, but, and we multiply them by a thousand or 10,000 and we project that image and we call that God. That's what the Greeks did with all their multiple of gods. They had all these different gods with different personalities that did all kinds of crazy things because they just made them up a a, a, a multiple strength kind of us. But here's the reality, loved ones. God is not a big one of us. He's not just us in the umph degree. He's not. He, He is before all things and God is light and there is no dark side of him. He doesn't get up on the wrong side of the bed. He he doesn't have a bad mood. He doesn't have a bad day. He's not hard to please. God is, in fact, predictably good. He is good. Well, of course, people quickly say, well, what about this world? What about the hard things that are taking place? And, And folks, we live in a world that is broken and there is, make no mistake, there is evil in this world and people make decisions that lead to devastating things that happen in people's lives and it makes you want to weep and it makes you sorrowful and you start to think, well, why didn't God do something? Why does he let this happen? Why didn't he do something? And loved ones, I'm here to tell you, he did do something. He came. He left heaven and became flesh and he lived among us. And Jesus showed us what God was truly like. And he was not like the gods we had made up. He was entirely different. He is this God who gave himself for us, who loved us so much, this much, that he died upon the cross to do what we could never do. So sin could be forgiven and that evil could be stopped. Now we live in a time that the kingdom has come. It is already here and not yet fully fulfilled. There will be a day where all wrong will be set right, where all tears will be, will be uh, stopped, where there will not be need for sorrow. But until that day comes, the kingdom of God continues to advance, but the kingdom is here and yet not fully yet. And we live in this time. And yet our God, in the midst of the craziness of this broken world, is a God who comes to us even in this brokenness. James says it this way. Catch this. James chapter 1 verse 16. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father, the heavenly lights, that does not change like shifting shadows. God isn't this shifty God that is sometimes good and sometimes bad. No, no, no. He is a God who anything good in your life, anything perfect in your life, that's the source of that is God himself. And, and, and there is nothing shifty in him. One more verse and then I'm done. Hebrews chapter 13. And it says this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This same Jesus who came and walked among us, who who loved us, who showed us what God the Father is like, who died upon the cross. That's the same Jesus we have now. And any thought, any idea of what God is like that is different than the love that is displayed upon the cross when Jesus died for us. Anything less than that amazing love is not the correct picture of God. Jesus is the same yesterday and today. And loved ones, he'll be the same forever. When I stand before him, he'll welcome me because he is the same Jesus. Now notice what the the writer of Hebrews says next. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. 
Folks, there's all kinds of strange teachings from the very beginning of the church to this day because we imagine things about God that are not true. There are all kinds of strange teachings. And folks, we are called on by 1 John, by John the writer, this old man who's seen a lot of life. He's saying, stay focused. Stay focused on Jesus and who he is and his amazing love for you. This love that invites you into a relationship. The relationship that was before the beginning of time. That the father who loves the son and the son who loves the father. And in that relationship, we have a common bond. And you're invited the God of the universe has invited you to have a relationship with him. Now, in this moment, if you know you don't have a relationship with him, maybe your faith has been based on a God that you've made up and you don't know this God. Or maybe you know that you're not right with him right now. (laughs) He loves you so much that he invites you right now into a relationship with him. Call upon him, pray, ask him. Ask him for forgiveness that you would know him who loves you so very much. Say a prayer something like this. Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I believe, I trust that you love me. Now, Lord, I want to know you better. I choose to follow you. I want to join your relationship with the Father. Lord, I thank you that you have my future. And I ask, oh Lord, that I would have the strength of the Holy Spirit to follow you and to love like you love. I ask that in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, loved ones, as we start walking through 1 John, expect, ask, anticipate the Lord doing a great work in your heart as we get to know him better in the days ahead. Now I want to say a blessing. The Lord bless you. The Lord, he will keep you. That his face is shining upon you, that his favor rests with you and that you would know the extravagant love of the Father, that you would know the grace of his Son and that you would know the constant fellowship of the Holy Spirit and that you would be empowered by his strength in the days ahead. Know this God who loves you so much. Know him and be firm in the faith as you keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you, Grace Church. We love you. We're praying for you. Thank God for the faith that is in your life. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or would like more information, Let us know in the chat or visit gracechurch360.org. Another way to connect with us is on Instagram or Facebook. Grace Church, I hope you have a great day.